Okay, so uh, welcome to our uh, workshop on quantum cavities and excitonic insulators. Uh, on behalf of the Flatiron Institute, I wanted to thank you all for coming for what promises to be uh, an extremely interesting week. Uh, as you know from the program, our pattern, except for Friday, which is uh, more like a conference, is uh, a small number of longer talks in the morning designed to summarize fields and provoke discussion, and afternoons open for research and collaboration. Uh, we, uh, Center for Computational Quantum Physics, have uh, two floors of this building, 9 and 10. There is a cafeteria on 11, and you're free to use essentially any available space uh, at these times for um, whatever legal purpose you want. <laughs> so, um, then uh, on the other practical things, I wanted to introduce uh, Paula Lucas and Mary-Kate Henley, who are administrators at CCQ and are helping take care of the conference. Um, if there are any issues that uh, arise or that you need assistance with, please see Paula or Mary-Kate, and they will also handle whatever uh, reimbursement issues may come up. Did you want to say anything? No. Just <laughs> over, over on the other side, as you came in by the elevators, please let us know if you have any questions. Um, yeah. And logistics wise, I mean, you can, there's really not tons of open desk space, but all communal spaces are open um, in the back. We have some seating over there. Upstairs, we have the 10th floor conference room reserve, uh, reserved. It's in the same space where the breakfast was, so we're pop up there. And then we also have a library space if you want to pop in there. First come, first serve, play nice. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I think. Lunch will be in the same spot yeah. as breakfast was, uh, and Wednesday night's dinner will be here on the, hopefully if the weather cooperates, on the roof and uh, in the, the 11th floor dining room space. Yes, and just to repeat, the 11th floor is a cafeteria and it's opened, you know, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and you're free to sit there also. Yeah, yeah there's plenty uh, of space. If you like. And there's a rooftop on 12, which is open for some amount of time. Uh, 8 to 6. 8 to 6. Uh, plus our plus our reception. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and you'll get breakfast and lunch every day, and yep. the mm -hmm. conference dinner on Wednesday. Wednesday. And for the rest of the week, for the evenings, you're on your own. I see that. Um, yeah. Okay, so then I guess you all know uh, Angel Rubio and Antoine George, who are mm -hmm. uh, really the brains behind this. Um, I'm just a figurehead. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, Antoine wanted to make a brief announcement, and then we'll proceed. Yes, well, welcome again. And I just wanted to uh, start the workshop with a little feel-good kickoff message. Uh, and we just learned a few days ago that Thomas Edison uh, won the gold medal of the National uh, Science Center in, uh, in, in, in France. Probably you don't know what this is is, but it's actually the highest scientific distinction uh, in France across all fields. There's one every year, and many Nobel laureates have had it in the past. So I think he deserves some applause. <laughs> okay, well, without right. further ado, I yes, let's proceed. So the first the talk is uh, Peter Littlewood, who's going to talk about an exceptional point as the dynamic critical. Peter. Thank you. And again, you have 30 plus 15 for discussion. Right. Is that on or do I need to press another button? No, you're good to go. You're good. good. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, so, ah, it is on. Thank you. Um, so, no, so, so thank you very much. It's really, it's actually really nice to be here for a science meeting, actually. Uh, as some of these guys know, I come here to cause them trouble on various occasions, and uh, so it's, it's nice to be uh, here talking about science. Um, sorry, this is a long talk, um, long title, but, and I'll try and explain what all of this means if you don't know. I should say right up front, of course, this is me, that the work that I will talk at towards the end, which is new, uh, is very largely done uh, by a postdoc in Chicago, uh, Rio Hanai, um, <clears throat> and uh, a little bit by a student also at Chicago, Alex Edelman, um, although he's working quite a bit on something else. Um, and recently, towards the end, we struck up 
a collaboration uh, with Vincenzo Vitelli, uh, <coughs> who's, I would say, sort of working in soft and active matter. And one of my stories here, actually, is that, uh, is that Polariton systems, at least when they're operating collectively, because they have local power, they're pumped, they decay, uh, there are tricks you can do <coughs> to get them to behave, actually, like uh, biological systems. Um, so, so going back over the years, I've worked on this problem for far too long. Uh, and, and so uh, all of the other work has been done by uh, students over the years, um, and one of whom is here, Jonathan, and I'm sure he'll uh, have some things to say. Um, I thought I should say, because this is the first talk of the meeting, a couple of big <coughs> picture things. Okay. Um, uh, so firstly, you know, why is there money in this stuff? Uh, so this is a money slide because uh, I mean I, I don't I don't try getting money for a living anymore. Um, but but uh, um, but there's a whole set of pictures down on the bottom about how, actually how you manipulate quantum systems with light and matter. Uh, it includes doing things like making molecules that you couldn't make by any other ways. Uh, bits of cavity QED. So there's a sort of a bunch of Chicago-focused projects here. Uh, that this is a little. Uh, cavity, which is uh, uh, which is quantum phonons. Um, there's a certain amount of biology for which this matters, uh, and this is David Avshalom's plot to rule the world with quantum computing uh, using spins. Um, but a lot of these systems are basically cavity QED, one way or the other, because you have a local quantum object, and then it's communicating over a long range. Uh, using using photons, and that prov and, and because you can tune via a resonance rather than tuning via spatial proximity, you have a different set of inherent flexibilities about how all of this works. Um, I have another view of this, and normally I begin with this guy for a colloquium talk, and although this isn't a colloquium talk, I thought I'd throw it up because the topic I will talk about, which is certainly polariton condensates. Uh, has a great wealth of classical analogies uh, going back to, to this guy, uh, who is uh, Christian Huygens. Um, and um, it's an interesting historical story here. Uh, he uh, did a lot of work on clocks. He had patents on the pendulum clock. He spent a lot of his time uh, fighting with lawyers on defending the patents and getting into all kinds of trouble that way. Uh, but he also got a research grant from the Royal Society to build clocks. And the purpose of building those clocks, of course, was to be able to measure longitude by timing with the sun, right? So this was a military research grant, remembering that the Royal Society was established uh, uh, to defend the government against uh, foreign powers. Uh, that's the purpose of what of it was there. Academy Francaise had more or less the same motivation. Uh, you know, amusingly, by the way, at this time when he was working for the Royal Society, Britain and Holland were at war, and he was in Paris, right? <laughs> so he could do this well. So um, he, one of the things he, he, he discovered then uh, is this out of his notebook, um, and this is a notebook, and here are two clocks. Um, and I think the point is because he was trying to build very accurate pendulum clocks, the only way to know how accurate they were was to build two of them try and make them identical and measure the difference. Uh, you know, otherwise, you had to sort of wait for noon the following day and hope that it was sunny. Uh, so, um, uh, and what he discovered is uh, um, mode locking. Uh, the clocks were in the same frame. They were coupled. Uh, and if the room was very quiet, then uh, they, um, they actually locked uh, in phase and as I say, it said, said consonant semper reciproca reciprocationis utri was quite perpendicularly so that they were out of phase, so they were phase locked like this. Um, so, uh, and interestingly, he deduced that this was phonon coupling. He called it imperceptible movements of the common frame because he couldn't see any motion, uh, but he actually believed that there had to be some elastic coupling so that the, uh, um, it's a nice model of pairing, actually. Um, now, um, uh, <coughs> that you can uh, sort of extend um, to not just two pendula, but maybe lots of them. 
So, um, and uh, <coughs> so, th so this is a you know, sort of an example of a whole bunch of pendula put uh, on a support. The support is free to oscillate. Uh, and you start them off all randomly. Um, <coughs> but these are our little local actors. Uh, and you see that, of course, that the frame starts jiggling a little bit. But after a while, and this takes a long time, so let me just move it up to here. Uh, what you can see is that they've now, you know, literally begun to synchronize. Uh, there are a few of the other them are lost. And you can see, of course, that the frame at the bottom is now macroscopically oscillating backwards and forwards. Uh, and, um, and it's almost there. There's one left over here. Uh, there's an amplitude fluctuation. That's a Higgs. Uh, <laughs> it will eventually decay <laughs> to the vacuum, uh, and, 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 the whole th and the whole thing will line up. Um, but uh, this picture of local oscillators, that here calls classical ones, coupled via some large uh, macroscopic oscillations, you know, is, is fundamentally how I think about polaritons, uh, where, of course, what you're going to do is you're going to replace uh, these little local oscillators by quantum oscillators, in my mind, uh, two-level systems. Um, and this thing becomes the cavity, which couples them together with some long wavelength modes, uh, which are really photons. OK, so um, let's go on with this. So, ne so now, um, if you, um, you know, very quick run through about what is a polariton, if I want an atom, uh, the atom, for me, of course, is going to be an electron hole pair, which is bound to make an exciton. Um, as I'm sure you all know, they're the solid state analog of positronium. Uh, but in materials like gallium arsenide, uh, their binding energy is quite small, and they're quite big. They're um, large um, um, 2D materials. Some other 2D materials, we've now got much more strongly bound uh, atoms in here. Um, these decay. Um, uh, and that spontaneous decay, of course, converts to a photon. But if you combine that photon um, <clears throat> so that uh, uh, it can be, well, not exactly reabsorbed, but coherently reabsorbed with an exciton. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so this is a process which, of course, produces a superposition of photon and exciton states. And that combined coherent excitation is called a polariton. Um, the reason you know, that this is of interest for what I want to talk about, of course, is that this is an object which has a very small effective mass, uh, and consequently, uh, characteristic coherence temperatures uh, can be really quite large. A uh, um, little bit more detail about how this used to be done. It's now done in many other ways. Uh, the way you make this work is, say, for example, a quantum well, which would confine uh, optically excited excitons to sit in some two-dimensional sheet, uh, mirrors on it with a cavity mode, which would line up like that. And so the bare modes would be some exciton uh, and some photon mode, uh, carefully adjusted so that these things are close to resonance. The coupled modes produce two branches, lower and upper polariton. And at linear order, of course, there's just a superposition of the two which is the ground state wave function. Um, one nice thing about these systems is because they're uh, inherently non-equilibrium, eventually the excitation will leak through the mirrors. Um, and if the mirrors are flat, um, when the, uh, what eventually emerges as a photon comes out, uh, the angle at which it comes out can be translated into the in-plane momentum. Um, so it's quite easy uh, to determine the spectrum uh, down at the bottom here. Um, and that's what people have done. So let me just sort of run through quickly some of the things uh, that have been achieved, right? So going back now quite a bit more than a decade, it was actually possible to confine <coughs> right, uh, states down here in the bottom of this, in this dispersion, uh, to get them close to equilibrium. Um, and uh, so this is a momentum distribution, actually, of the photons emitted from that trap going back about 15 years. Um, if you look closely at the bottom of this dispersion, um, you'll recognize, of course, 
without pressing too many buttons. Um, so this would be here, the parabolic dispersion, and the white line is what it is if there aren't any excitons in the system. Um, if you uh, shift it uh, up to the pump state, it moves upwards. There's a blue shift, which is just the Hartree interaction. Uh, and if you look carefully, you can convince yourself actually that you see a linear mode there, sort of a Bogolubov mode. <laughs> you can image the coherence, uh, and so this uh, fringe is associated with uh, imaging the coherence of the photons that come out, um, and you can see vortices and also half vortices. Um, the system is 2D, so if you look at the correlation of this pattern, um, it produces a power law tail, uh, as it should. Um, there are things which have been called superflow, and I think Jonathan will, might decide to tell us that this isn't quite what it says it is. Uh, but, but nonetheless, reflecting a kind of a sort of extra stiffness of, uh, of coherent modes, and I may have something more to say about that. Um, and also, you can make you know, pairs of things, and you can couple them, and you can begin to see interactions. Um, so, uh, so there's a long story here, and there's much more of this, and this has been done in wide classes of systems. Um, and so I, you know, what I want to talk about in the end uh, is a little bit more of a detail about some of this. Okay. Now, uh, starting point in terms of theory, um, the way I like to think about this, and if you like, there's a kind of generic microscopic model, which is to turn excitons into spins. So if you say that I think of an exciton as a two-level system, it's either there or not there, I don't put two of them in the same place, I can replace not there by a downspin, there by an upspin, um, and of course the spins get flipped by an absorption or emission of a photon, uh, and that produces a sort of a generic model that looks like this. So psi is the photon field. I've just put in one photon mode, uh, k equals zero if you like. Here are the spins. These are the energies associated with the uh, excitons, which you can think of as being localized. Um, and then there's a coupling term here, uh, which involves uh, absorbing the photon and flipping the spin, or the other way. Um, and uh, a coupling constant G, the Rabi coupling. Uh, but, um, but important to note that you know, within a wavelength of light, there are very many excitons. N is that number. Uh, and so this model is written down. Um, uh, you know, has a parameter n which is much larger than one, um, and um, therefore it's very well described by Minfield. <coughs> so, if you look at this, you know the ground state which you can be sure of in the limit that n goes to infinity is something that I would call BCS. BCS in the sense of a coherent state of both the excitons. Uh, and the photons. And if you want to get something that looks a little bit more like real BCS, if you represent this object in terms of uh, hardcore fermions, you can expand this spin operator in terms of, of course, a raising and lowering operator, and you can expand it out, and you get something that looks exactly like sort of a so-called BCS wave function. And so this I think of as kind of the plain vanilla description uh, of, uh, of very many different systems uh, associated with this. Okay. <coughs> so, um, now, there's a bit more than that. Um, if, in particular, you put in two things that matter in these systems, one, of course, is actually that there are multiple channels. There's dispersion of these modes. It isn't just k equals zero. Uh, so I think this is probably a piece of Jonathan's thesis uh, here just to calculate the dispersion curve from that model, but including, uh, but including momentum. Whoops, sorry. Uh, so here you can see the upper polariton branch. Here you can see the lower polariton branch. Because there's disorder in the model, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, uh, excited states which are single particle-like and are non-dispersive. Um, and of course, it has uh, ghost branches coming down the other side. So that's the dispersion. Um, uh, and, you know, the other thing, um, which is also, I think, a you know, product of Jonathan, is what happens if you uh, could couple the system to the outside world? So you take the Hamiltonian I would have given you and you couple it to two baths, 
Uh, one bath which is just decay, the photon field can escape, and another bath which is designed to pump, so that you pump energy into the system. Um, <clears throat> so then we now have a, an open system with a source and a sink, and so there's a damping and a pumping, and the two things play off against each other. At equilibrium, they're in balance. But as a result of that, uh, this Bogolubov mode coming down here, this linear dispersion, eventually will become diffusive at long wavelengths. And the way to think about that really is to go back to this picture of oscillators moving, oscillating together. Imagine they're all coherent. But then what I do is periodically I remove some of them, and I put back in other ones with the wrong phase. So every time I, so every time I pump, I'm adding uh, an oscillator, but I'm adding an oscillator out of phase with the condensate. And that eventually stops you from having waves which can propagate through infinite distance, and the modes become diffusive. Uh, okay. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> adding together those things, you can produce a kind of generalized, whoops, a generalized phase diagram uh, uh, for this system. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> firstly, let me just <clears throat> let me put it three axes here. One is temperature in the sense that along this plane, you should imagine you're in thermal equilibrium. <clears throat> um, and this is the density of the system. Okay. The system, I, the state that I just described, uh, uh, the BCS like state lives here. It's a coherent state. There's a BCS like transition where it goes up here. Um, it can actually have a Motlo. This is difficult to see experimentally. And the reason is that I can uh, populate the system in such a way as I fill, of course, uh, I flip all of the spins. And if all of the spins are flipped, then there's no way of coupling to light. And so that produces a Motlo coming down here at very low densities. Uh, again, quite difficult to get to. Uh, you uh, begin to notice the, uh, the, the spatial degrees of freedom. And there's a crossover to something which would be described as BKT, but this is pretty small. <clears throat> now, I've now put another axis along here, which you can think of as a decoherence parameter. Think of it as pair breaking, if you like, in the sense of a superconductor. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, of course, if you add enough disorder, eventually you'll get to something which is uncondensed and so-called weak coupling. So what's the crossover here along this zero density line between strong coupling and weak coupling? It's just that uh, you know, gamma crudely provides a line width. Uh, if, if that's comparable to the Rabi splitting, then the two modes overlap. Uh, and you can only see one peak. And down here, you can see two well-separated peaks. And that's generally called a crossover from strong to weak coupling, at least in, in this community. Um, might be worth thinking about going all of the way down to the end here and imagine what happens if you take a system which is in weak coupling and you pump it very hard. Uh, actually, what you get, of course, is a laser. Right. So <clears throat> the usual treatment of a laser is the James Cummings Hamiltonian that I wrote down, but however, in the limit that this is very large. Uh, but I still have a broken symmetry at the mean field level, which has, a, which has coherence of photons. But there's no coherence of the electron hole pairs, or at least very weak coherence of the electron hole pairs. Um, and if I then ramp back down uh, and make the system less and less uh, uh, decoherent, um, I will eventually get a crossover to something which must match here. Um, and one way of thinking about that is if I get down here, I'll begin to see gaps in the system. And so this is, if you like, a kind of a crossover at some level from gapless uh, to gapped. But there's no uh, real symmetry change in all of these phases. Um, and of course, you can find limits of all of this space where you're really dominated by photon number uh, we're being very large rather than the exciton number. And sometimes this gets called photon condensate. But all of these things have no distinct um, uh, broken symmetries. Uh, so, but there can be transitions between them, and I want to explain why. Okay. Right, so, so there's no clear distinction between a polariton condensate and a photon laser. Uh, they both have macroscopic population of photon mode. Uh, the difference is that in one limit, the excitons are also coherent. They're following along with the coherent field. 
But in the laser limit, they're very weakly coherent, but there are so many photons in the system that I can still maintain that despite the fact that there's no imbalance. Um, so you know, is there a phase transition between the two? Um, um, and I'll point out right now and come back to filling this out, is one can certainly conceive of coherent condensates uh, the, of different kinds. Um, and you know, the one I described to you in that experiment is a ferromagnetic con condensate. They're all in phase. It turns out that the two-particle one that Huygens found was actually an antiferromagnetic condensate. They come out of phase because the coupling is different. And so there can be different kinds of in or out of phase condensates. Um, and I want to suggest that that's one way of thinking about some of the phenomena that we see. Um, a bit of experiment. Um, quite often, um, when you uh, do experiments on these systems, you get so-called two-threshold behavior. So what are we looking at here? This is the intensity of the peak of the light coming out at coherence. Here is the first threshold where there's a big onset of that. Okay. Uh, turns out here is a second threshold. If you look at the frequency of the light, um, uh, it actually seems to jump twice. In fact, this probably isn't a jump, but this one certainly is in this case. Uh, so it looks like these are um, two distinct phases. Um, and sometimes this is called a strong to weak coupling transition. Uh, so we go from something here where this typically begins to look like a laser because often this frequency is very close to the bare cavity mode. This frequency is associated with coupled modes. And so I have a transition from something which goes from that. And so I say it's sometimes called a, like a vertic vertical cavity surface emitting laser. So that's one possible thing. But the question is, how do you have a transition if there's no broken symmetry? Um, and well, of course, we know how to do that. It's called a first order transition. Um, back from a more theoretical perspective, I'd like to distinguish uh, the idea that in non-equilibrium state, I could form condensates of two types. We've been talking about this one. I'll call it a minus condensate. I have a condensate of that one. I could imagine finding a way of uh, populating this branch and not that branch, when also I would think that uh, the dynamics would favor condensation. Um, the, um, both of these things are, uh, because we're in non-equilibrium, they have pumping and driving. And so the maintenance of all of those things is associated with one or the other. Uh, um, but, it, but there's no symmetry distinction between these two. But normally, I will have a jump between them if I change parameters so that I would cross this. I would normally call this a first order phase boundary. Um, and it is then conceivable, of course, that that first order phase boundary can end uh, at some critical point. But in order for that uh, boundary to end at a critical point, I need to have a solution of the dynamical equations where this mode uh, and this mode are at the same energy. So normally, they would be at different energies. But there's conceivably a point where those energies can be brought together, just like a first order point. Um, and that, you know, mathematically is, in this two-component system, a, uh, an exceptional point. So, the, um, so in particular, I can imagine that, uh, particularly as I detune, uh, this should be possible to see, because you can find situations where this will there. And we can do you know, microscopics on this uh, to talk about that. And this is all in a paper, which is just recently out. Um, now, rather than doing microscopics, we're used to thinking about kind of a minimal model, um, which for uh, you know, complex-driven fluids is generically something which is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation or a gross pedieski equation. And I've written it here um, for a two-component system. So you can think of those components here written in the diagonal basis as photons uh, and excitons. Um, and the simplest thing I can do to describe that, of course, is to have the photons damped, so there's an I kappa where they escape, and the excitons pumped, so there's an IP with a plus sign. Um, and the nonlinearity is expected to be mostly in the exciton component, but none of this really, really matters. Um, <clears throat> if I want 
to, f so to find a steady state solution of this, a common state solution of this, the time dependent solution has to be one which is oscillating with a particular uh, self consistent energy, self consistent frequency. So that's the frequency where the light will be emitted. Um, if I look at a two component system here, normally, of course, I'm going to get two eigenvalues. But remember, because this is a solution of a many body problem, I have to pick one or the other. I can't have both. The only time I can have both is if the solutions coincide at a particular point. And then when the solutions coincide at a particular point, and this is a more you know, calculation within this model, you can find a critical line which ends. There's a little regime of potential coexistence with this. Um, but it has two identical real eigenvalues. So um, you know, the conditions which allow you to produce uh, 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 identical eigenvalues of a you know, two by two non-emission matrix uh, are of course not general. You have to tune parameters to do that. But one of the things you should notice is that at the point where that happens, the eigenvectors are not independent. Right. So it's uh, at that point actually formally you cannot diagonalize the matrix um, because both uh, eigenvectors the e, the corresponding to the E minus mode or the E plus mode end up being completely identical. Okay. Uh, so that I think will matter. So you know, just briefly I'll tell you about things that we're doing at the moment given in the context of this is a workshop and uh, uh, so none of this is published yet but there's sort of drafts floating around. I'd now like to go beyond mean field and everything I've been talking about is in mean field you know, if you've got a critical point, what might be interesting about it is what happens to the fluctuations in that vicinity. So, you know, a classical conventional critical point you're used to thinking about like this. There's some potential here, uh, writing down an XY-like model with an amplitude and a phase. Um, and that in the ordered state, there's a minimum associated with some uh, amplitude. But of course, there's a phase degree of freedom which allows you to run around the bottom. So you will generally, generically have a massive mode an amplitude mode, and a phase mode, which is a Goldstone mode. As you go to the critical point, uh, the amplitude mode um, uh, softens, becomes massless. Uh, and then, you know, at least in mean field theory, in the, at the critical point, uh, when I get to this point, the, the massive mode has uh, disappeared. Uh, correlation length has gone to infinity. Uh, but these two modes are still orthogonal. So if I think about the phase fluctuations, I can treat them independently. Right, so, so, they're, so they're added together. If you do the same thing towards a critical exceptional point, it doesn't work like that. Um, indeed, normally, if I'm far away from it, I will have a massive mode. So that massive mode, for example, if I was condensed in the lower polariton branch, would be fluctuations into the upper polariton branch. <coughs> But then as I get close to the, the, the critical point, and I bring those modes together so that they actually coalesce, um, it turns out that the two uh, eigenvectors will also coalesce so that both fluctuations are mixed. That doesn't mean that I don't have fluctuations in the perpendicular direction in any thermal system. Uh, but actually what it means is at this point, um, I have two independent Goldstone modes that reappear. Um, no, it's not complicated to do this, but a little bit of analysis. So if I linearize, uh, linearizing um, uh, will naturally give me this form of this. So this is the, the NDT. This is the coupling term, which I've now linearized. Um, and the leading gradient term then will actually be KPZ-like, uh, grad theta squared. And here's this linear term. Uh, if you ignore the gradients, you see that there are just two couplings here, SL and SG. Um, at the exceptional point, they become equal. Um, and then you can see that you can get the dispersion, the linearized dispersion. You can really do this in your head. Uh, and you see that if delta S is finite, um, I will have two modes, one of which will, uh, will be uh, damped. As this is an I delta S, and the other of which will be dispersive. Right, so I, so I have two of those, a diffusive, sorry. 
But at criticality, both of these turn into gapless sound bites. Um, so, the, uh, so the response changes. Okay? And um, because the eigenmodes, as I get to this point, are parallel, I can't diagonalize the linear response. I can only triangularize it. I can get it to this normal form. Um, what that does, of course, then, is to give you a response function with two poles. And the off-diagonal piece has both poles. And if you compute, then, just in linear response, the phase-phase correlation function, uh, what you find is coming from this piece here, coupled by the external noise, uh, 1 over k fourth singularities, rather than the conventional 1 over k squared. Right? So, the, so the dimensions are shifted, um, uh, because there is inherently a random field term, which is generated by the dynamics associated with coupling the modes uh, to do this, that, that shifts you uh, uh, from the dimensions you would have expected. Um, uh, last little bit, then, of course, you can try and look at that and do perturbative RG. Um, and uh, what you plotted here, actually, are the two things that you might care about to scale. One is the velocity of the sound mode. The other is the effective diffusion constant. Uh, that's comprised by what is an effective uh, interaction strength. And this is a modification of the coupling constant. Um, no, you don't need to follow all of the details here, but one of the things to notice actually is that uh, clearly this is an expansion around six dimensions um, and because of that shift there. Um, unfortunately, it's not helpful, or maybe it is helpful, I don't know, because uh, there is, you find actually a, uh, an unstable uh, critical point sitting somewhere here, um, and the flows of these two variables, sorry, this got renamed, Y and C are the same thing. Um, actually, flow off all to strong coupling, but there are two different strong coupling points that you can get. One strong coupling point actually is where the diffusion constant uh, uh, diverges, and effectively that means that damping has overtaken everything and the solutions become flat. Okay? And another one is where it goes the opposite way, which tells you that the excitation has taken over and the diffusion can't keep up with it, and the system has, uh, uh, has become uh, very disordered. Um, so you know, th this, this is all in progress, and I'd be happy to tell you about what we're doing. So last comment, which is to get back to Huygens. Okay. Um, as far as I can see, this is a pretty general idea. So if I take more or less not quite a lot of two-component theories. Um, I build in what, I would, what one would call you know, sort of an active matter principle. Namely, you have non-reciprocal forces. So the moment you have pumping and damping, it means that B acting on A doesn't produce the same force as A acting on B. And actually, the simplest example of an exceptional point in a two-particle system is when FAB is equal to minus FBA. It's sort of anti-reciprocal sort of anti-Newton's third law. And so, you know, so um, we sort of describe this as, I know, lately sort of, a, you know, birds and penguins, right? So, you know, the birds chase the penguins, the penguins run away from the birds or something like that. But they, and the reason for choosing that model is that one component models are very well understood for this uh, and are used for uh, models of bird flocking, a uh, so-called Tona 2 model. Uh, in terms of you generalize that to two components, uh, one can find these kind of dynamical instabilities appearing in models like that. And I will say, I think, it was already in Huygens' problem, because it turns out the boundary between these two phases is actually a boundary between ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic coupling, roughly, in terms of a dynamical systems analogy. And that, uh, and that as those two points become degenerate, you find a whole host of new phases which uh, appear associated with this. Uh, so. That's the end. Sorry, I've talked too long. Oh, but I should advertise a book. Your library should all get this. Um, that's it. Thank you. OK, so uh, questions. Uh, sorry to leap exactly into, directly into the middle. Um, let's say in your, um, you know, your model where you sort of look at this 
transition between the polar what I interpret yeah. as the polariton laser and kind of the standard right, laser. Right, right. Um, and in your let's say in what you derive in terms of the fluctuations, what are the connection to the I mean the measurable quantities in a sense? Do you predict kind of a what could you predict in terms of the line width, for example? Is that well, well, so 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 I mean, I, so at least at the Gaussian level, it's sort of in here. So the so um, uh, so so, um, but there's. It turns out that there are some odd features of this that we haven't entirely um, tied up yet. Um, uh, it turns out actually that the system becomes very stiff at this point, and so the uh, so the compressibility uh, begins to diverge. Something which has been seen in another context of when you ha actually have driven systems that that. Jonathan might say something about as well. So, but nonetheless, the, the, the thing to look for, so is, um, no, um, so going back to experiments, which I showed you early on, I showed you an experiment which actually has a jump. Yeah. There are other systems, and people have made those, where it's quite clear that you can tune continuously through this, and you don't see any single behavior. So even experimentally, it's reasonable that there is a point where that jump goes to zero. So that would be the critical point. Um, and the, uh, the thing to measure there would be the spatial and spectral fluctuations associated with the condensate emission, right? uh, which, should, uh, which should reflect, at least at the Gaussian level, uh, this, this kind of dynamic. So this is, a, if you like, a very singular uh, response. Right? So, so you would see kind of a divergence of the the, I mean, the line width we should go through an extremum. Then. Well, well, I'm not sure. About the, I'm, I'm actually confused there. I do, the reason we, we don't have a paper is I don't know about the dynamics. The the statics are such that there should be uh, spatial fluctuations right. corresponding to corresponding to k fourth. So if you were to look at uh, no, no, at least well s of q if you like across right. the sample for the light emission, right. it would it would have uh, very sharp wings, which would develop. At least at the Gaussian level, right? Because this would be, in a sense, a much stronger experimental feature than change of slope. I mean, change of absolutely in out is really not something that I think I, no, I, I, in terms I, of the characterization. I, no, I, so, I, so I agree. So, so I say that the um, um, you know our statement that that point is a critical point means that it should have critical dynamics associated with it, right? And they've not been measured, uh, so maybe they're not there. Um, but uh, um, but and and we don't have completely firm predictions for what what it should look like in, in that case. But uh, I think it would be something interesting to measure. Be delighted if you. Know. Yeah. Okay, more questions, Subir. Yeah, um, I'm a bit confused with the relationship of many of the models you mentioned. So you, have, you mentioned one called the James Cunning model. Yeah. James Cunning's model, which has an infinite range interaction. Right. Uh, and just a single photon mode. Right. Presumably, all this stuff. Is not in that. It's right. It's not so, sure. So experimentally, what distinguishes where you want to be? Well, I mean, I, so I mean, I think so. Uh, it, so it turns out that a lot of physical systems, which are where you know, actual physical condensates, which are built, are quite small. Uh, so there are, you know, in effect, very few modes which couple. So actually, you want large systems. So I say that. So I, I would add, of course, the full dispersion of the modes. And those and those in interactions, which which are kind of necessary to get that. So when so you showed these pictures of DECs at the beginning, those were in a many many photon mode. Well, I mean, so 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 no, typically those are really few photons. It turns out it's very difficult to see spatial fluctuations in polariton condensates. I mean, it, it's it's been uh, challenging to do this because uh, they're typically quite small. Um, and the interactions are effectively quite long range, so it's uh, so they're they're quite BCS like, if you like. Wait, I'm sorry. Can I just ask for clarification? I got I got lost in this discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. To be, uh, so, Subir, I thought you were saying first question is whether you can live with one photon mode or many. And well, if you have one photon mode that got infinite range interactions, yeah. And as Peter said, that's just described by mean field, classical mean field theory. Well, in a finite system, that's I mean, yeah. The, but, he was, that, that's where I got confused. Well, once there was something about you, finite systems. Right. Well, so so let's so let, 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 let's at BECs and and this. Uh, 
Right. Uh, so, so, so it's this the right. equation. That's not in this class. Of, right, this right, class exactly. Of right, so, so the answer is that the models I'm really talking about have sum over k in here and a dispersion of these right. and coupling between k uh, and, you know, and, and that. So there's, sure. so there's a, right. So, so that then has, you know, if you like, all of the richness yes. uh, that, that, that. That, you, that you actually need in order to do this. Um, I, what I would also say is that um, my view now is that, you know, I wouldn't start there from here. You know, frankly, a much better place to think about theories is just to go to what you think is a very natural thing to do, which is a gross pedevsky equation, where you can put in all of those long wavelength fluctuations as you like. Of course, it's phenomenological. Uh, you can derive a gross pedevsky equation from microscopics. That's what Jonathan did. Uh, um, and I don't know whether he regrets doing that, because it was a lot of work uh, to, to be able to do that. But it's rare that there's anything new that we found which is coming out of the microscopics that you couldn't have got by going for a damp-driven field theory to start with. Okay. Uh, Just going back to this uh, exceptional critical point, which right. is obtained by out of equilibrium. Yeah. Is there any reason why the system would like to reach that point and the, the in, intrinsic dynamics of the system will not bring you out of that? Like a splitting, you have those two modes, <coughs> and then the, that, that state will survive only for a short time? Well, OK, so there's all kinds of things that could be wrong about this. So one of the things that, even in these models, the only thing that we have solved is to look for stationary solutions of those yes. equations. Okay. Uh, um, I think it's quite likely that there are non-stationary solutions associated with that. And therefore, the system could easily develop some complex dynamics associated with this. Uh, now, we're beginning to see this a little bit by looking at these Toner 2 models, which have a microscopic analog, which is called a Vickshek model, uh, where, you, where, where, um, where you begin to see the onset of what you might call turbulence, effectively because you develop chirality associated with the two components, and they mix in complicated ways. So I, so I sort of don't know, right? I mean, I, you know, I just, uh, but, you know, but you know, as usual, you know, if at mean field level you can find some critical point, it's kind of usually interesting to look in the vicinity of that, because there will be phenomena that you have predicted and probably many that you haven't, right? So, uh, so that, that's why I think it would be uh, uh, useful to do this. And again, I'm not. No, it, it might be easier to do it with birds or drones than it would be, because all of this is classical physics. I mean, it's not really, uh, there, there's nothing intrinsically quantum about anything we're doing. Thinking about that connection to Turner 2 model, what one big difference that often comes between driven quantum systems and classical active matter is that almost all the driven quantum systems we think about are not um, number conserving. We right. change the numbers of particles. And then if you think about first order transitions, you end up in the regime which is like fixed pressure ensemble. Um, and you have first order transitions rather than place separation. Whereas when you write kind of agent base, fit check model, etc., they normally conserve numbers. I, I guess predator prey depends if you actually allow things to eat each other. Yeah, right. Um, but then if it's number conserving and it's fixed density ensemble, they show phase, um, phase separation um, and, and segregation. Don't right, I yeah, right. I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I agree. I think that's a good point. There's another way of looking at this, right? So that um, if you think of sort of general nonlinear dynamics equations, you can have PV relationships which are S-shape or N-shape. Yeah. And I think that's what you're talking about. Um, uh, no, uh, no um, and, and they produce you know, very different dynamical behavior, right? So it's the difference, if it's an IV curve, it's the difference between a gun diode and a, uh, a filamentary conduction, right? And so, and as you say, that's kind of built in at some level to what is held fixed and what is held conserved. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's probably something to that. I don't really know, but I think that's a very good point. Okay, more questions, discussions, comments? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the phase diagram, I, I saw uh, photon condensate. Uh, you right. didn't explain. Can, can you elaborate? How well, I mean, I, well, I mean, I think so, so loosely. So, so if you like, um, take this model, for example. Um, Detune it so that the photon mode is very far above the exciton mode. 
um, then just fill up the excitons. Um, uh, where was it? Sorry, somewhere I had this. Oh, no, it's, it's going forward. Then, then, I, then I just fill up the exciton levels, right? So the first thing that happens is I hit a mock lobe, which is uninteresting because uh, I've filled all of the exciton states. I'm all in the upper level. All of the spins are pointing up. They can't interact with photons. Okay? Then I raise the chemical potential again. Um, as you raise the chemical potential again, it get the, I begin to occupy you know, the upper mode, which is really the photon branch. It's entirely photon-like. And I begin to deplete very slightly the, uh, the, the exciton branch. So at that point, you've uh, got a very large amount of photons interacting with a few hulls uh, at the top of this level and playing off those to make a uh, to make something which is, you know, a, a condensate which is totally dominated by photons. So that so the so if you so if you divide up the number in the condensate, uh, it doesn't divide up equally between excitons and photons. There's a preponderantly very large number of photons in the condensate, and a very small number of excitons. But that's different from a laser. Because in a laser, those excitons would not be coherent with the condensate, even though there may be few of them. So, so, so in, yeah. in terms of correlation functions, uh, essentially you're saying you distinguish the photon condensate from the laser by a correlation function, actually, of the excitons. Right, right. Yeah, so I, mean, so, so I think, though, so if you, so look, if you take a regular laser, right, the, the sort of an electron hole laser, the thing that's in this pointer, right, so that the, um, you know, what's in there, um, there's a very large number of electron hole pairs, um, but they decay, uh, but they decohere very rapidly. But there are so many photons in the condensate that even within a very short decoherence time, I have the opportunity to uh, to have a um, uh, you know, to, to, to have a stimulated emission that fills up the photons. Right? So so there's always in a, even in a regular laser. You know, some coherence in the exciton component, it's just very small in comparison to the photons. Okay, uh, other questions? All right, well, then this is perhaps a good point to uh, thank Peter again thanks. for a very simple.